Hello everybody. Um, we are going to talk with Jack about watching the wheels from Double Fantasy. I'm going to do my little one minute spiel. So in November, the end of November, I bought Double Fantasy for my mum for Christmas. So I wrapped it all up. Mm -hmm. Starting over, we just come out. It's like either late November or very, very, very early, like first day or two of December. And so I, I wrapped it up and put it under the Christmas tree. And then John Lennon was killed. And I remember unwrapping it and saying, sorry, mum, you know, I've got to listen to this record. Yeah. And, and for me, it was when I was completely and utterly into the Beatles. I was so immersed in the Beatles music. It was all I was listening to at the time. You know, you remember those days we put on a record? Oh, sure. You wouldn't even turn over to side two for two weeks. Yeah. So, you know, when you're in that period of loving music. Mm -hmm. And so Double Fantasy became that record for me. For weeks and weeks and weeks, it's all I listened to. And so this is a, a very important record for me because I was 13 at the time. You can figure out how old I am now. And- I was 15 when I produced it. <laughs> I thought you were 14. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's just a really, really important record for me. I was, uh, I was uh, 34. 34. Yeah. I thought I was old. <laughs> I think I'm old now. <laughs> so um, we're going to play Watching the Wheels. John, um, he sent me a, a cassette from, uh, from Bermuda, which Yoko gave to me. It was in an envelope that said, for Jack's ears only. It had a lot of songs on it, some still not heard. And I took it home and he, and he said to me, um, I'm gonna call you tomorrow and tell me what you think of these songs, because he didn't think much of them. He, he was very insecure about whether he could still write a song. And he was, had been down in Bermuda. There were, I listened to them, they're very primitive. He was singing into a Panasonic uh, beatbox. Just, yeah, singing into that. And then uh, playing off of that into another beatbox and double tracking his vocal. Two and, cassette players. Yeah, uh, you know, and not, no wire, just the playing and the mic, that was it. And, and then doubling his vocal or singing a little. I was doing that me. in 82, so yeah. I, was, I was a bit behind him. And then, and then he would be, you know, he would add some other guitar part or something else to it as it went over. So it was that primitive. And he called me up and he said, well, what do you think of these songs? And I told him, just put out this cassette. You don't need me. I can't beat it. You know, it, they're, they're just, it's an incredible statement. They're, the songs are beautiful. Does that cassette still exist? Yes. Two cassettes, actually. And they were all narrated. He would say something before the song and something after it. That was usually pretty funny. <laughs> and, um, and, and his insecurity was obvious by what he would say. He'd call it another piece of shit. Or, this proves I can't write a note. Or uh, this one's for Ringo which he had, there were a few songs that he wrote that were for Ringo. And, and um, I told him that. So he says, I'm taking that to mean that you think the songs are good. And I said, I said, take it to mean that you should just release this cassette. <laughs> he said, no, that's not gonna happen. Uh, he said, okay, so we're gonna make a record. Here, here's, uh, here's the thing. No one can know we're making this record because I'm not sure this is going to go so well. And I, the last thing I want is the press to know that I attempted a comeback and couldn't do it. I said, by no one, you mean no one? No one. He said, absolutely no one. He said, you, uh, I'll meet you at the Dakota and we'll go over all the perimeters. So he came back and I met him at the, at the Dakota and he said, look, put together a band. Uh, all I, I want to know that the band is my contemporaries. So if I want to jam on an Everly Brothers song, I want them to know it. Whatever I jam on, I want them to know. And so I put together that band, which is Tony Levin and 
and and uh, Andy Newmark and Hugh McCrack, Hugh McCrack and George Small in New York. He also said. He also said he wanted a New York rhythm section. He wanted that real New York sound because he considered himself a New Yorker. He also said to me, and this was like a real warning to me, he said, look, I know how hard you like to rock. This isn't about that. Back it up. Back it up. He said, this is a song. This album is a guy that's about to turn 40. You know, I'm not making believe that I'm a rocker. I want it to be a contemporary statement of where I am right now. So throttle back on the rock. No Aerosmith on this one. No, no Aerosmith. And uh, I mean, he was well aware of everything that I did. He was, he knew, you know, he followed my career. I, so I, I, I understood what he meant. He also said, just do the arrangements, which, now I had a band that I couldn't tell whose album I was making. So I charted all of the all of the songs. If I wasn't sure about what chord it was, I would ask him and he would tell me. So all the songs were charted with the lyrics under them. At the rehearsals, I sang two weeks of rehearsals, me singing the songs terribly, but in pitch, and them not knowing whose record it was. Now, after the, I would record each rehearsal and then go back to the Dakota after well, the rehearsal. How did you do, oh, Yoko, oh, Yoko? Without <laughs> them knowing who was in what record it was. No, no, I did, uh, yeah, oh, I didn't just, do that. Oh, okay, yeah. Just the track. <laughs> just the track. Yeah. 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 So I would go back to the Dakota with the, I don't think even that some of these had little lyrics on them. Though when I look at, at, in my house, mm -hmm. I have the original copies of a bunch of the songs framed. And the lyrics, the lyrics are under them. My favorite is "Beautiful Boys." Beautiful Boys, is yeah, beautiful. amazing song. And, and they had that. Uh, the, I've all the you know my handwritten charts and um, up frame. It's, it's great. People come in. They little. Any father that has a son. Yeah, right. I know. Now I've got two. So I would go back to the Dakota with my cassette and uh, jump in bed with him where he liked to work. And he, yeah, he was surrounded by, he had this huge bed, he was surrounded by all gadgets and monitors and tape machines, and his guitars were behind him so he could just reach back and grab one. And, um, and I would play him what, what I was doing with the band. And uh, watching the wheels, was doom jang a ding jang a ding jang. I'm just sitting there watching the wheels jang jang. So I kind of two step. Yeah, and I did it. Yeah, that's what it was. And so um, that's kind of the way I was going. And he said, "That's not, you know, I wrote it that way, but that's not what I'm thinking." He said, "Let me just put this thought in your head. I want it to be circular. Whatever you can do to make it feel more circular." And so I, you know, I cut it in half. It, it is, it's half the time of the, the, his original demo and arranged it the way, he let me arrange everything and he would just make suggestions about what to change here and there. I, I, I you know, Bob Lefsitz, I did his podcast recently and he asked me, who was the hardest person you ever produced and who was the easiest? And I had to say that the easiest was John which is an unexpected answer because you'd think, here's a guy, he was the, you know, he was the Beatles. <laughs> you know, how do you just produce him? Doesn't he demand this and that? He was so easy. He drew a long, a, such a professional line between what the producer does and what the, what the artist does. And the decisions were left to you. You, you had to make these choices. Now, I had seen him when he worked with Phil. He beat Phil up mentally. Maybe because Phil deserved it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because Phil was already in bad shape. You know, he was one of my heroes. But to work with him and see him, you know, wake up from a stupor and just say, more echo, and then go back into a stupor. Although, I'll... I'll I saw Phil be Phil, the spectacular specter, 
when we did Happy Christmas. Mm. When he did that, he was so in his element. You know, four acoustic guitars around one mic, an omni, and uh, all playing the same thing. And the orchestra, the, the children's choir, all very Phil. And, uh, and, and he was in his element, and I was impressed. Before that, I hadn't been. And, but by the time they got to uh, rock and roll, he lost his mind. And it's just de degenerated. So this song, and the reason I, I mentioned this, Watching the Wheels, is we were doing the record for some time, and no one knew that we were doing this record. Uh, the press, obviously, the, the studio knew and the musicians knew they were all sworn to secrecy like if the word gets out the record stops now you don't want the record to stop mm -hmm. if you're doing this record so everyone kept their mouth shut it was no one knew uh and john would make the decision when it was time to re to tell the world and it was after i compiled this vocal on watching the wheels Part of it is the live vocal, because he did live vocals on everything. And they were wonderful. So part of it is the live vocal, and then four other takes. He would just go out there and tell them, just to go through it four times. Don't, don't think about it. Hold your guitar if you want while you're doing it. That sometimes made him comfortable, sometimes it didn't. He'd do four and he'd, he'd go, okay, go, uh, let me know when it's done. He'd sit there next to me and nitpick over this vocal, this S is better than that S. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's like, I mean, that's where we are now. Uh, you and I know a couple of singers yes. that are like that. And, and um, <laughs> I didn't have to, you know, really delve into word by word all about how it felt. And for the most part, the live vocal was always great. Sometimes he would sing the wrong lyrics or just bugger off and not sing at all or... And it was just a matter of sometimes replacing those or finding something that was just so much better from his new ones. So it was very easy. And, uh, and he'd come back and he'd listen and he'd say to me, is that the best? And I'd say, yes. And he'd go, okay, I'll double it. <laughs> and that, he'd go out and double it. He, he could just, he would listen to a whole verse and then go out and double that verse. Obviously experienced. <laughs> just a little bit. <laughs> yes. His mic technique was like nobody else's. Uh, he could catch a pop or an S in his hand. Just, he'd anticipate the P, the P catch it. His, his hand would go by and then he would throw it away. It was like, and he'd work the side of the mic for different sounds. He'd get, you could hear it in his headphones. So it was very easy. And at the end, after this vocal was done, he listened back to it. And he yelled out, Mother, tell him we have a record. And that was, uh, that was when we let the world know we were making a record. And every record president in the world was lining up. Incredible. In my naive assumption, this song sort of exemplifies the whole record. Absolutely. Because the lyric is, I'm just sitting here watching. It's like he's telling the world, and you can tell me I'm wrong, oh, but he's telling the world where he's been for the last three or four years. That's exactly right. Which, sem which seemed obviously at the time like an eternity. Yeah. Nowadays, bands put out records once every three or four years. Yeah. But oh, the him, whole record was nothing but the truth, mm. which is pretty much what John has always been. You told me something in a car nine years ago when we were driving, and I said to I said to you one of those kind of like fan questions. Uh. So you have to excuse me. I said, "What's the most important thing that John Lennon ever told you?" And you said. Tell the, the truth, truth and, and make, make it, it rhyme. rhyme. That's what he told me. His other, his other words of wisdom were like, if I make a mistake, make it louder. They'll think <laughs> I did it on purpose. <laughs> That's great. And also, you know, the whole thing of his tuning the, the D string flat. Oh, I never told you that. You didn't tell me that one. He would tune up his guitar, yeah. and then he would tune the D string slightly flat, just a little. Yeah. And I, finally I said to him, why do you do that? And he said, well, back in the day, we would make these records and we'd all be playing. And I could tell my Aunt Mimi, that's me, hear that guitar? Oh.
That's beautiful. Yeah. All right. On and on we go. Beautiful. We don't have the multi-tracks for this song, so that's the reason why we're not playing them, but fantastic. Thank you ever so much. You're welcome. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Thank you for watching.